And another verse that you could look at to try to describe today's culture and, and the direction we're heading, in my opinion, is from Romans 1. It's a much bigger, you know, continuous thought, so I'm only pulling out a little bit of it here. But it says, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. They exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. So at the real root of this is idolatry. And I've said Psalm 2 so many times from the pulpit here, right? Psalm 2 is basically the world saying, get off my back, God, and stop telling me how I'm supposed to live my life. Why do the heathen rage? And Peter quotes that in the book of Acts when he's been put on trial. And he says, surely, Lord, this is what you were talking about that they're trying to set a plan against the Lord and his anointed one, but we're not going to stop talking. <laughs> That's the same Peter that denied Jesus in the New Testament, full of the Spirit, says, okay, you officials, you decide whether it's right for, for us to listen to you or to God. We've already made our decision. We're listening to God. So you do whatever you have to do. That's conviction, isn't it? And that's what we all need to have today. And look, I don't really think that studying 14 hours a day necessarily, that's not a bad thing, but you know, you could, you could dive so deep into the details of all the social issues that you're not reading your Bible because you're so busy trying to keep up with this. And it's not by might or power. Yes, be informed. Don't give a, an opinion, a, a real strong opinion about something you haven't done a lot of homework on, but understand the basic truth is that, right, God, we believe that pro-life is the biblical standard, that for as soon as those first two cells are conceived in the womb, that life begins right then. It's not about a heartbeat or any of that. It's that we're created in the image of God, and we're going to fight to try to protect that, regardless of what the culture thinks. So they worship the creature rather than the creator certainly fits on that topic, right? Because one of the things the world would say, get off my back, God, is God is saying that if you want to live a, a really prosperous life, put boundaries around your sexual behavior. Make a commitment to one person and you're ready to commit with that person for the rest of your life. You're not signing a contract. You're making a covenant commitment. And you're standing not on a stage, on an altar. It's a sacred, holy thing. Matrimony. Joining together two things that were separate now become one. And Paul says, don't you understand that when you join yourself to a prostitute, your spirit became one with that person? And that when you leave them, you're leaving a part of you behind. And that fractures our spirit, man, and fractures our personality, and it, and it breaks the confidence that we have in ourselves because we feel defiled when we get into that sinful lifestyle. And people just say, you know what, I'm so far gone now, why bother trying? Somebody said, uh, I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. Think about that. Talk about counterfeit affections. My life is so miserable that the only way I can get by is to drink because if I don't drink, I'm going to need a brain surgery because that's how messed up my life is. That's so classic of what the world does. That's what working for the devil is like. You end up in a mess. So we're saying, no, look, you really should. You're going to prosper if you just put boundaries around your sexual behavior. Nobody in America wants to hear that right now. I'm, I'm a free bird, and I can do what I want. And if we're two consenting adults, we can do whatever we want. And it's true, you can. The thing is, should you? And what is it doing for our culture? It's destroying the culture and destroying the nuclear family. So we're going to just take that stand for, for biblical logic. It's, it's been what the church has been teaching for 2,000 years. It didn't just all of a sudden become okay. Marriage, man and a woman, Okay. Not confused about which is which. We know which one's a boy. We know which one's a girl. Yeah, I, I'm, it's another day, but this is the cross, okay? That's what I'm saying. You've got to say the key to a secular community is understanding the cross. And that's what this commentator said. He said in 1 Corinthians, Paul urges his readers that when living in a pagan world, how many live in a pagan world? I'll wait until you raise your hand. If you want me to go faster, wave at me, Okay. <laughs> if you're living in a pagan world, they should see everything through the lens of the cross. It takes a continuous effort for us to think our way back into the life in Corinth, but not really, because we live on the East Coast near New York City. It's not that hard to think of a secular culture, right? I mean, before the pandemic, I was in New York every week, and 
There are certain parts of New York you can feel the sin in the atmosphere when you're walking through certain neighborhoods. There's a stronghold over that region. Not too big for God. That's what we're here for, to cause a shift, right? And then he says, these letters to the Corinthians provide endless insight into the challenge of living the Christian life in a pagan world. So I would say that's informative for us. And we started in verses 23 and 24, but I just want to go back in that same chapter. And, and Paul said, For this message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, come on, it is the power of God. The cross is the power of God. Because you don't just get to come in and take a decaffeinated version of Christianity. <laughs> it's the full bore or nothing. Right? You can't have a, a, a watered-down version of the gospel. You're either all in or you're not in. Right? I've got to give my life to him. Now look, everybody's at a different place of growth. We all start on the milk and hopefully we transfer over to the meat at some time and we become mature. He's not looking for perfect people, but he's looking for men and women that are after his heart. That's what he honored David for, right? Not, he clearly wasn't perfect. But he was after God's heart. And that's always been our goal, to help you pursue God in whatever we feel. And you, you know, tell us and what we can notice about you and pray. And the Lord speaks to us that this is where you'll flourish. That would be a great, a great gift to give anybody is to help them know what God's calling is on their life. And then to help them flourish in that calling. All right? Those of us being saved, the cross is the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will thwart the cleverness of the intelligent. That's a quote from Isaiah 29, 14. And then Paul just asks this rhetorically, where is the wise man? <laughs> we can think about that today too. It just depends on which station or which website you want to go to. Everybody's claiming that they have the answer. And you can basically find a, a validation of any opinion you want. And that might be new to this culture, but I've been in economics since I was in college in the 80s. And there was also always an economist that could tell you whatever you already wanted to hear. And I told you a couple weeks ago, there's something called confirmation bias that you really have to watch out for because it's this tendency that we only go to the things that we already believe and we look for people to validate that, but we don't give a really clear picture to the other options. And obviously not, the option has to line up with the word. But the, the only way you can, I feel, the only way you can be respectful to the other person is at least understand what they believe and why God's opinion is stronger than theirs. Always going to be stronger.